Well, I think I'm going to go ahead and and get us started. I'm going to introduce Reich first, and then I'll um, offer up a prayer so any latecomers maybe won't come in right in the middle of the prayer. Um, Reich is a is a good friend of Chris's and mine. We've known each other for a couple of decades now, yep. I think, yep. <laughs> and have done um, Reich uh, goes to the church that Chris and I, where Chris and I met. And it's the church that I grew up in uh, down in Raleigh. It's Edenton Street United Methodist Church, for those of you who know that area. Um, he is a an attorney. He works at uh, Duke Law School. He has a number of titles, and I'm just going to read them off to you. He's the John H. Adams Clinical Professor of Law. He's the Director of Clinical Programs. He's the clinical professor of environmental sciences and policy, and he is the co-director of the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. Um, <clears throat> Reich has a great heart for the environment. And for those of you who did the braiding sweetgrass study last year, you can thank Reich because he's the one who gave me a copy of that book. And uh, I fell in love with it, and I was glad to share it with y'all last summer. Um, <clears throat> when I told him that we would be discussing it as a church, he suggested that uh, we should read some of Norman Worsba's works. <laughs> ah. And uh, so I told him about our connection with Norman Worsba and, uh, uh, you know, so just that that nice connection there. <laughs> Reich, is there anything else you want to tell us about you before I open us in prayer? It's better to start with prayer first, and then that way I can I can disabuse them of any um, any notions that we need to disabuse. But all that's <laughs> wonderful and lovely. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, let's bow our heads. I'm gonna uh, actually. I'm. I'll, let me tell you about the prayer first. Yeah. This is a prayer that came from from the PCUSA's site on eco-justice, but it was written by C uh, Gemma Corbett of the Catholic Agency for Overseas Development. So we have a uh, an interdenominational prayer today. All right, let's bow our heads. O Holy Spirit, you hovered over the deep at the dawn of creation. You fashioned time and space itself in the initial magnificent flaring forth. You breathe life into all beings, and you continue to dwell and work in all creation to sustain that life. Be with us now at this critical moment of our history. Open our ears to the cry of the earth, suffering the effects of human exploitation and unbridled consumption. Open our ears to the cries of our brothers and sisters living in the midst of extreme poverty and hunger. Give us a deeper awareness that we are part of all that you have made, that we are intimately connected to all that has been, all that is, and all that will be. Grant us a spirit of awe and wonder as we contemplate the marvels of your creation, recognizing and giving thanks for your presence within and around us. Give us a deep respect for all life and help us to renew our commitment to foster life wherever we are. Give us the courage to denounce all that disfigures your creation and to commit fully to caring for our earthly home and for all the created beings we share it with. May we live lives characterized by compassion and service, and may we embody your love in our relationships with one another and with all creation. Amen. Well, it's so great to be with you all this morning. And, um, as Hope, as Hope mentioned, um, we met in the Methodist Church, um, but I was raised a Presbyterian, and in fact, my grandmother said, um, told me once that we were foundation, we were Presbyterians before the foundations of the earth were set, um, and that reflects the fact that three fourths of my grandparents, um, so three fourths of my ancestors were Presbyterians, basically since the time that they came here as settler colonialists uh, in the colony of North Carolina. The other fourth is the longest piece and the longest were settler colonialists in Virginia. 
uh, and they were Episcopalians, so um, or Anglicans at the, uh, originally, and then Episcopalians after the Revolution. Uh, and then uh, there there are a few Baptists sprinkled in there here and there, but mostly it's been Presbyterians. And I, I have a great deal of affection for that. My wife um, was raised a Southern Baptist, and um, so I was raised a Presbyterian. So we became Methodist, and and sort of feel, I guess, like we've maybe settled in the middle or something like that. But um, I do think it's important for me to go ahead and just say right up front, you know, I am descended from settler colonialists. And when they came here, um, the ancestors in Virginia um, were very interested in farming. The ancestors in North Carolina were very interested in turning all the wonderful longleaf pine savannas that they encountered into um, building materials. And so they were involved in the industry that was referred to as naval stores, which was one of the number one industries in North Carolina, um, you know, uh, in the in its colonial days, uh, and all the way up through uh, about 1880 or so. And that was um, cutting down longleaf pine trees um, that were chopped into lumber, and mostly the large, large trees were turned into ship masts for the British Navy and then the American Navy. Uh, and then the boiling of uh, turpentine and pitch um, the industry itself, of course, becomes part of the reason that we are called Tar Heels. I don't, I am a, a UNC fan, but I don't believe that Tar Heels were actually, was actually a um, positive nickname. I think it was a sort of derogatory nickname about the, the dirty industry that we were all involved in. You get tar stuck on your heels um, when you're boiling tar and pitch all the time, which is what they were generally doing. So that's who I am. That's where I come from in terms of my background. In law school and in my church education, I came to realize how important Christian ethics were. And in my environmental law practice over time, I became really convinced that um, thinking about um, issues that we face in the environment through a justice lens is really important, which is why on this first slide, I have this picture of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial in Atlanta, um, which has chosen as its quote, until justice rolls down like mighty waters and righteousness like a mighty stream from Amos 5.24. But as Christians, and for that matter, any of us who are coming from an Abrahamic faith, uh, our, create, our, our environmental um, focus generally begins with our thoughts about creation. Now, this will be a bit of a review because you all already read Breaking Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, excellent book, um, does a really good job in there of talking a little bit about one of the creation stories. There are multiple creation um, stories uh, among the Indian and American Indian tribes and indigenous people, Native Americans, if you'd like to call them that, in the United States. Um, and the one in, of the Haudenosaunee people is this uh, story of Sky Woman and then Turtle Island, Turtle Island being the name for the land on which um, we live. And the idea of Sky Woman, just as a reminder, since you've already read this, is this woman who is already pregnant falls from a hole in the sky. She was part of this group they called the Sky People. Um, the world that we live on um, was covered by a vast ocean. There was no land. Birds come up seeing her fall, and in compassion, they cushion her fall so that she falls gently. And they also um, maneuver her so that she falls onto the back of the great turtle, the largest turtle that's floating in the ocean. And the various sea creatures, um, the otters, um, the fish, all uh, have compassion on her. They dive down to the bottom of the ocean and dig up mud and bring it back up. Um, and then Sky Woman, who had brought with her um, seeds and plants, plants and then creates um, the foundation of agriculture. And that becomes their focus, if you will, as a Haudenosaunee people and thinking about how, how the world was created. Um, they don't go any further back than who created Sky Woman, who created Great Turtle. We don't know where all that came from. They just go back to this particular point to focus on Turtle Island. One of the key pieces of this particular creation story is that it also um, binds very well with the concept of reciprocity. That is that we have uh, reciprocal um, arrangements with the natural world and Sky Woman herself participates in reciprocity uh, with Great Turtle, uh, with the creatures that helped um, support her. And, and, and then in turn sees her role as helping to provide um, in, in reciprocal fashion um, for creation itself. Now, of course, in, in the Abrahamic faiths, we're dealing with, uh, uh, all of us are dealing with 
a, a set of stories that come to us um, that are in the Hebrew Bible. So for both um, Jewish and Christians in general, we're looking at the specific language in the um, Jewish uh, Torah, the first book, the creation story in Genesis. And when we get to the question of how humans are, um, are desired to, by God, to relate to the earth, we have this fairly famous passage from Genesis 1, uh, 28 through 29. And you'll often see some of these some of these words that I put in bold um, talked about. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which uh, is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for meat. Uh, later, uh, after the flood, uh, we get the um, amendment to the covenant that allows humans to eat meat. And then later we see further refinement of that in the Torah, um, where there are prescriptions or proscriptions, uh, things you can eat and things that you can't eat. So the concept of kosher um, is introduced later um, on in that. Um, and But at this time, the idea was you're only supposed to be eating um, vegetables, fruits, and uh, and and uh, and and seeds. Now, the, another language translation that's has come up. There's a, I've looked at this in a lot of different translations. Most of them do use the term dominion. I think this one, the Common English Bible, is the current version that we are using at the church uh, which I attend. And I've always been interested in its approach. I also like the Living Translation. Um, whenever we're interpreting Hebrew terms. We have to recognize, especially when we're looking at things like the creation story, that Hebrew is a really rich language. In some ways, it's very simple, but it's also very rich. One of the ways in which it's very rich is there's lots of echoes of different terms or words in word structure themselves. Um, in this particular case, the way the Common English Bible has taken the same um, language is to say, be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and master it, take charge of the fish in the sea. Um, so dominion, which is one way of thinking about things, also has this idea of taking charge. So there's a slightly different connotation. But nevertheless, it's very clear um, that at least for Jews and Christians, the way that Genesis is reading to us is this notion of mastery um, and of we're in charge. Uh, there's just no doubt, no matter how you interpret it, that's the, that's the English equivalence that we get. Um, from the book of Genesis. And so that's the reality that we're facing when we're dealing with that. Now, there are other parts of this um, story, though, that are really important to take in, in play, where I think sometimes we as Christians don't always pay attention to. And one of them is really, um, is really important is that on each of the days, whether you're reading King James Version or Common English Bible or any other version, uh, in each day, there's one thing that God does, which is he sees it, and he, and he sees it was very good. Here we, here we have from the sixth day. Uh, and God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Common English Bible, almost the same. He says, supremely good. Um, so, it, you know, very or supremely, regardless, God has declared creation itself to be good. And this is obviously one of the things that Norm Wurzba really does focus on. I was so glad to hear about that Not I actually... Um, coincidentally, I didn't know this was going to happen when we set this up, but Norm's 60th birthday party was yesterday and I was invited and Dr. Wurzba had collected this whole group of people um, from Duke and from his, um, his, his life in the community in Hillsboro um, to come and celebrate. It was a wonderful opportunity. Um, I invited my wife to come and we both agreed after we were done that it was the most fun party that I'd had with people at Duke in years. Um, they're just they're just full of joy and full of life. And um, and Norm's doing great. So um, if you read further in Genesis two through four, we also see some interesting notes. You know, the seventh thing, the seventh day God rested. Um, uh, Abraham Heschel has said that we should remember that the Sabbath was the last thing that God created. In other words, it's, it says his creation was done, but it was done of the heaven and the earth. What wasn't done at that time was the Sabbath. And the Sabbath, Heschel argues, and I think it's a really profound realization, that the Sabbath is created, that the first six days are focused about creation as it relates 
to space and to things and to um, creatures. The Sabbath itself is actually created as a temple to time. It's one of the only places where the creation is specifically re related to time. The seventh day you shall rest. And it's it's a recognition that um, that with all this creative activity and all those kinds of things, it's really important for all of creation to have some form of rest. And we see Sabbath and then the ideas of Jubilee and other things expounded later on in, the, in those scriptures. I wanted to um, also just say, you know, some of the other things that we see in Genesis 2 through 4 are some of the other things that have influenced a lot of our Christian and Abrahamic um, faiths, this idea of exile from the garden as being the punishment for falling to the temptation, uh, and the idea that agriculture itself is a curse. In other words, that at some point agriculture was wonderful, and then because of this, there's a, a curse on, on humans that the agricultural practice, we will be having to fight weeds all the time. We're going to have to work really hard and to, to pull something out of the dust of the ground. Um, and then Cain, you know, when he kills his brother, he's cursed by becoming a nomad, um, which I think is an interesting um, an interesting point. Um, so next, I wanted to talk a little bit about what are some other um, uh, faith traditions from around the world? How do they view um, the created world? One, I, we don't have enough time today to go over all of them because that would definitely be like, several weeks worth to talk about. But I did um, have a student at Duke um, who had given me a um, stamp um, that had the, the Chinese characters in the left-hand margin of this slide. And I asked him about that. And he said, well, this, I was teaching him water resources. And he said, you know, this is the, um, this is the shorthanded version of this particular um, aphorism in Taoist literature, the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, the highest good is like water. Water gives life to the 10,000 things and does not strive. It flows in places men reject, and so is like the Tao. And I thought that was a very interesting um, piece of wisdom literature because I compare it to what we see in Ecclesiastes. You know, we have this very strong recognition right here of the hydrologic cycle. All the rivers run to the sea, and the sea is not full unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. We can find in our wisdom literature throughout um, throughout um, uh, the, the Christian Bible and throughout um, the Jewish Torah and the, and the wisdom literature um, that is referred to as the wisdom literature and the wisdom writings, this notion. I did want to point out, I didn't put a slide in here about the Quran. Um, the Quran itself does have um, references to Adam and Eve, but the Quran itself does not contain as a piece of literature the same, it does not include those um, first five books in the same way. It's not attempting to present a comprehensive chronology of pre um, of, uh, of early events, including the creation story itself. But there are references to it, which make it clear that uh, the Quran itself is based on the same set of characters and the same basic set of assumptions that we saw summarized in the slides that I just gave you. It differs in details. Um, uh, the nature of the curse is different. Um, the nature of Satan, he's not a serpent. Uh, he's named differently. So in the Quran, we do have a different view. But I do think it's important to note that um, the word Quran itself means way to water. Uh, and, and, the, and the concept of water and life are really, uh, as well as um, the concept of dust and our relationship to soil um, is really important in all three. Uh, as well as this notion of God as the creator. Now, politics and religion. Um, I mentioned that I was a settler colonialist. So my folks came to the United States um, from Great Britain and the British, um, uh, uh, Great Britain large. Some were from Scotland, some were from Ireland, some were from England, some were from Wales. They all, though, came to the United States, what we call now the United States, when it was a British colony, and that was where they lived, were British colonies. So we were, they were strongly influenced by British colonialist ideas, uh, wherein the king was conquering these lands um, for the benefit of, the, of, of Great Britain and its civilizing mission. Um, the um, Spanish and Portuguese colonies had a different um, religious basis for what they were doing. Uh, the Pope had actually issued papal bulls um, directing that lands that were conquered 
by Catholic countries would uh, be given a um, special dispensation for ownership of the land and for the way in which they treated um, the natives they found. That uh, that that philosophy changed over time. A recent, I think it was less than two years ago, um, the Pope Francis rescinded the prior papal bulls that authorized the taking of land um, by Catholic countries uh, in prior times and arguing that it was never the intention um, to give that political movement. Once the Americans had, um, American colonies had uh, won the Revolutionary War, uh, we go from a period where it's no longer European colonialism, but American colonialism that starts to take place. And this particular picture that I'm showing you um, was painted in 1872. Um, it's called American Progress. I do want to see if I can activate my highlighter and do a laser pointer. And I'm going to point it a little bit. You'll notice in American Progress, we see here Native Americans who are being pushed out. And they also are in the dark side of the continent. So they're being pushed further and further west or, or further and further into the interior. We also see up here a herd of buffalo, again, being pushed away. Here we also see progress carrying in an ar in arm a, um, a book symbolizing the progress of knowledge and stringing along right in her other hand. You can see this. What do we see here? Telegraph wires and the railroad. Railroad is coming west. We see the um, quintessential American story of settlers moving west, the, um, the wagon, um, frontier train, the stagecoach. And we see farmers who are coming down here, immigrating in um, and, and plowing the field. And we notice these are all white folks. We also see the deer um, sort of still sticking around, but also running away from progress. Um, so American progress and manifest destiny is a very powerful notion in, um, in, our, in our country. Where does it come from? Well, um, it's a political thing. It's not as much really a religious construct as it is a political contract, construct. Andrew Jackson, the President of the United States, um, had a very um, pronounced and, and singular vision of politics, and he brought many people along with him. There were many people in the United States who believed this, and this became the foundation of a political party that we that became what we now know as the Democratic Party. Um, the Democratic Party's uh, approach on these particular issues has changed significantly over time, but when we're talking about the early 1800s, this was certainly uh, what we think of as Jacksonian democracy. The main principles there were to create uh, open suffrage um, but it wasn't universal suffrage. It was open suffrage for free white men over 21, meaning you didn't have to own property in order to be able to vote. Uh, so that was essentially, but it was limited just to free white men over 21. He also is a huge believer in the patronage spoil system. That is, when a new president is elected or a new um, executive comes into power, um, all of the offices of the executive should be open to being appointed by the um by the president to reflect their views. The Jacksonians really had strong opposition to all forms of monopoly, and that came from their opposition to banks, especially the U.S. bank. Um, Jackson himself had belief that banks were tools of oppression of uh, middle class people, um, and uh, and were and monopolies were also um, something that, uh, that would, was something that he found to be. The bank monopoly was the thing that he really objected to and the way in which the monopoly of banks allowed them to have this stranglehold over, over other uh, affairs, which also led them in part to a laissez-faire economic policy. The opposition to monopolies in banks and laissez-faire economic policy was essentially we shouldn't be printing money or credit on the basis of the reputation of a bank or its authority um, from a federal system, but instead money that is backed up only by silver and gold and also hands off as it relates to trade and other policies um, was supposed to be the um, policy of the United States government. This also led to a strong argument for very strict construction of the constitution itself with a very limited power for the central government. This was one of um, the key points of that. We see that displayed in what are referred to as the Cherokee cases, a series of cases, three cases in a row that were brought um, before the um, Supreme Court of the United States in the early 1800s Justice John Marshall 
delivered the opinion of the court in all three cases. Um, the first court, the first case involved um, the basis of American title. That case is pretty infamous because it argues that, that the reason that we have that Amer that the United States government had title over Indian lands was the doctrine of discovery and essentially saying that since European among European nations, since the English were thought to have discovered uh, the uh, North American continent um, in the English colonies, that that extended to them ownership of those lands vis-a-vis uh, -vis other European governments. Um, the doctrine of discovery as articulated in this particular case, Mac the Macintosh case, is now widely discredited by scholars, but it's still the law of the land. It has been cited as recently within the last decade as still good law. Uh, and essentially that's what deprived in our sense of property, the property of indigenous people in the United States to title over their land. Um, and the, the second case came up, uh, there was a, an attempt by, um, uh, by uh, the Cherokee tribe who had a treaty to bring forward a complaint against the state of Georgia. So it's the Cherokee tribe versus the state of Georgia. The Supreme Court said, oh, sorry, uh, we don't recognize the Cherokee tribe as a nation. Uh, so your violation of treaty case really can't be brought to us. Sorry, come back later with a better case. So they did. They found two white missionaries. The state of Georgia had forbidden these white missionaries um, from going to the Cherokee nation and working with Indians to help to try and improve their lives and to teach them Christianity. Um, in that particular case, the Supreme Court did take that case and say, why, yes, this treaty does protect the rights of the Cherokees, and you as individual people have a right to bring this forward. Interestingly enough, the Cherokee were very wise. They brought sympathetic plaintiffs. They brought two white missionaries. They didn't bring Cherokee. They brought two white missionaries to bring their case forward. And that one they won. But Andrew Jackson did not enforce that judgment. His view of central government was very convenient. He said, let Georgia do what Georgia wants to do. And what did Georgia do? Well, they ignored the Supreme Court. And uh, Jackson ignored the Supreme Court as well. Now, Manifest Destiny is also what we think of as being one of the um, uh, shoots that comes out of Jacksonian democracy. The term itself uh, was coined in a particular um, uh, uh, editorial um, that is attributed to John L. O. Sullivan. He might have, it might have, he he might it might have been ghostwritten by another who chose to publish it under Sullivan's name. But Sullivan was the the noted author, and Sullivan it's consistent with his style. He wrote a bunch of other things like this during the time period. He was a Jacksonian, um, a big supporter of Jacksonian democracy, and um, after the. Um, uh, Texas War with Mexico, so the Mexican, what we refer to often as the Mexican-American War. Um, you know, we start out with Remember the Alamo, we end up with Santa Ana, and we end up with um, the conquest of Mexico. Uh, there was a lot, large feeling in the in the country, including by many of the military who served in the Army of the United States that marched against Mexico, um, that the um, that the Texas Revolution and that the and that the war itself was not really a just war. And um, that particular feeling was pretty widespread in the country, including among veterans and including a num a num among the, some that would go on to fight in the Confederacy, as a matter of fact, in the Civil War, and certainly among some of the Union generals as well. But uh, there was a strong political tide uh, in favor of annexing Texas. And this was uh, manifest destiny comes out in that in that discussion. It could have been that Texas could have stood alone as its own Republic of Texas, which is what it became, you know, following that. But the question was, would we annex it into the United States? And so Sullivan, just talking about why it is that we need to go ahead and annex Texas, uh, has this idea. It's now time for opposition to the annexation of Texas to seek the fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the dock continent allotted by providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. Then he goes on to insult Mexico and talk about California. California, probably. Imbecile and distracted, Mexico can never exert any real government authority over such a country. Already the advance guard of the irresistible army of Anglo-Saxon immigration has begun to pour down upon it, armed with the plow and the rifle. 
and making its trail with schools and colleges, courts and representative halls, mills and meeting houses. A, soon, a population will soon be an actual occupation of California over which it will be idle for Mexico to dream of dominion. It was prescient there. It certainly happened. Um, it was accelerated by things like um, discovery of gold in California. But I do think that this um, manifest destiny is a is a fair statement and has been said by a lot of people. Um, a scholar at Duke uh, has written um, a, a that this is an older idea, and I like his characterization of it. And he also points out that even if you don't see modern people saying manifest destiny now, this idea of providence that we see mentioned in here um, uh, is certainly, when you see that picture of American progress, that seems in many ways like a personification of this idea of providence. And uh, he refers to this concept as providential republicanism. And, and that allows us to connect up both Sullivan's ideas with even earlier ideas, such as those of the um, founders of the colony in Plymouth, who um, articulated it as a shining city on the hill. The idea that if the colony were to succeed uh, in the United States, in Boston, in, um, uh, in, in New England, if the, if the pilgrims in their quest to establish a colony succeeded, it would be proof to the world of this shining city on a hill that God's favor is upon them. And so the idea that um, Jed Purdy puts this under is he calls it providential republicanism. The idea that by having good government and freedom of religion and the Christian religion in particular, we're going to enlist the aid of providence in expanding the republic itself. And so he sees a theme that goes through it. And he actually can, he argues, and I think it's right, you can actually still see those themes in modern American politics. So even if we don't use the term manifest destiny, be on the lookout for some of these other ideas, which I think you will see in, in political ads to this day. Um, leads me to a, a point I wanted to make about the relationship between natural resources and human rights. Um, the American bison was eradicated, almost eradicated, um, by the year 1890. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to watch it yet. But there's an excellent Ken Burns documentary on this that really expands more than I could in this short slide. But essentially, we had a situation where at European contact, uh, the buffalo, where you all are right now, buffalo were roaming. Um, I mean, they were roaming down to the Catawba River. Uh, there were buffalo sightings by colonists um, in modern times. Um, probably the only reason they didn't make it in Eastern North Carolina was that Pine Savannah was not a very um, friendly environment for them in terms of feeding. That was better for white-tailed deer and some other species like that and, and upland um, birds. Um, but uh, and, and most of that area that you see that's not covered in um, uh, that's that's east of there would have been a pine. All of this would have been pineland savanna. But anything here where you have acorns, nuts, um, pecans, other things like that and grassy prairie um, were all areas where the bison were roaming. Um, and you can see how quickly it went. Um, it retracted. This is the um, this is the um, sort of pre-contact. Um, extent. Here we are in the 1870s. It's already re retracted after the American government decided that exterminating the buffalo would end the Indian wars. Um, they um, attracted um, uh, uh, hunters. Um, I believe it was um, General Sherman who actually um, invited game hunters from all over the world on the railroad to come out and shoot bison um, to get people excited about the possibility of bison hunting in the 1870s. And here we are, we see it starting to retract. And then by you know, 1889, it's just these tiny little dots here. So you can see how rapidly that occurred. There still are bison. There's been a, re a resurgence in certain places. Um, I visited um, Utah in 2018 and in the center, right outside of Salt Lake City, which you can see in the distance up here, um, right in the middle of the Great Salt Lake, there's an island called Antelope Island, which does have antelope on it, but it also has American bison. And um, I, I was able to get up close to them and, and really enjoyed that. This was a picture I took with my phone, not with a long distance lens. I was only about 40 feet away. Um, if y'all ever want to see bison, I would highly suggest that's a good place to check them out. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the different tribes we had in North Carolina and what happened there as well as the history of, of 
of racial slavery, just because we're going to talk a little bit about environmental justice. And one of the aspects of environmental justice that we're going to talk about is um, race. And in the United States, we um, American Indians and American Indian tribes have specific status under our constitution. Uh, it is a status below that of um, states and nations. As I said, in those cases, the, um, the Cherokee tribe itself, even though it had treaties with the British and then had treaties with the United States, was viewed as a dependent nation and not given the equal status as a state. When they went against Georgia, they were not treated the same as, as the state of Georgia. Um, so they have a inferior status in many ways, like the enslaved persons in our constitution, um, where they only counted in the three-fifths clause um, towards apportionment uh, as three-fifths of a person. Um, this is a this is a general um, a generalized map of uh, Native Americans by cultural and language and, and group in North Carolina in 1500. So this is shortly shortly after contact. So my um, yes. my family and ancestors in North Carolina were primarily down here. Mine in Virginia were up here. So they were primarily in contact with the Tuscarora um, and other tribes uh, in that area. Now, what you're going to note when we move over is, and you can see obviously where you all are, um, the Cherokee uh, and other and some other tribes um, had a very strong um, thing. You'll see here the three different language groups and also the Indian trails. For example, if you were to fo uh, follow the great um, trading um, path, uh, that goes up. Some of these trading paths go all the way down. The one here goes all the way up to the Great Lakes and then extends all the way down um, to Mrs. the state of Mississippi. And so um, these trading paths were um, not wagon roads, um, but they were evidence of extensive trade networks um, between and among people, even though they were separated not only by tribal identification, but by linguistic groups. Iroquoian here in the green, Siouan here in the yellow, Algonquin in here uh, on the coastal plain in the orange. Now we see in North Carolina, um, I want to be clear, this is just a generalized idea of where um, we have tribal communities um, and urban communities of, of um, indigenous people, um, Native Americans. Um, so American Indian tribes, a specific context here, the only federally recognized American Indian tribe in North Carolina with a reservation is the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians. Uh, the reservation, the Kuala boundary is up here um, uh, south and east of, uh, south and west of you all, um, but uh, Cherokee are all up in, in all of this area. So any of these places that are showing geography you know, sh should be understood that there are still um, uh, several hundred thousand um, uh, in, uh, American Indian tribe members and Native Americans who identify with a state recognized tribe, or in some cases may have uh, made descended, have uh, ancestors who were members of those different tribes as well. And that's why you see things like urban Indian organizations. So like in a place like Wake County, um, you have a lot, uh, a large population of people who were descended um, from American Indians. And so they may want to uh, belong to a specific um, association. So we have the Triangle Native American Society. Um, and, and then yet we also have um, specific tribes, including the Okanichi Band of the Sapone Nation in Alamance, Caswell, and Orange County. No reservation, they're state recognized. Um, and all these are sort of legal terms. Um, the North Carolina Commission on Indian Affairs is in the North Carolina Department of Administration. Um, the head of the North Carolina Department of Administration is herself um, American Indian. She is descended and has um, ancestors that are members of both the Kawari and the, uh, what you see here in green, Harnett and Sampson County, and the Lumbee, and the Lumbee are in Robinson County. So, um, I like to show these two quickly just to show the spread of slavery and its concentration. So in the time of 1790, um, slavery was primarily an Eastern um, uh, colonial enterprise, very heavily concentrated in the coastal regions of all of these states. But by the time of the, um, uh, after we admitted Texas, for example, <laughs> to the Union and and as, as slave had spread west. So in this first, in that first wave of slavery, we had a set of belts that were related to tobacco cultivation, rice cultivation, and naval stores. By 1860, cotton had become king, 
and we see this big expansion of a cotton belt all through here, which is not to say there weren't tobacco and other crops that were being grown in some of these other regions as well, but we've moved, the plantation economy had, had in 70 years transformed uh, and cotton had become a really, really critically important part. So we see a very widespread. That brings us to um, slightly more modern times. Um, and this is where I've gotten into this. As I mentioned, I'm an environmental lawyer and I've been interested in environmental problems. And Warren County, North Carolina is one of those counties that was very successful um, economically under the slave economy. Um, it was uh, to cotton and tobacco. 66% of its residents were slaves in 1860. Braxton Bragg, it was his home county and his brother who'd been governor of North Carolina did get kicked out of the Congress because he sided with the Confederacy. Um, and this is another tale of two counties in two places. So Warren County is one of them. Uh, Ward Transformer in Raleigh is another. This is an aerial of the RDU airport. If you've flow it, flown into RDU airport or visited, you've been right up next to the Ward Transformer Superfund site. Ward Transformer had been in Southeast Raleigh. Um, when the new airport was created, they thought they'd get in on the new industrial park and they created um, their ward transformer business out at, at the RDU authority. 1978, North of the uh, United States decided that a class of chemicals called polychlorified PCBs or polychlorinated biphenyls um, are too dangerous to be handled. And they were classified as um, hazardous substances and they needed to be uh, carefully handled. Um, polychlorinated biphenyls are, were widely used from the 1940s through the 1970s in just about everything that involved equipment that might touch fire, hydraulic fluid, or electrical current. So most of the modern things, as simple as you know, every every street where there was a transformer hanging on the side of a power pole, that became uh, a source of PCBs. And when those transformers got old, they would be sent to um, the ward transformer and the transformer would be um, reconditioned and different parts of it would be sold off and they had to do with the used oil. Um, these guys decided they were gonna make a killing and corner the market on PCBs, uh, Mr. Burns and Mr. Ward. Um, and they tried doing the business for about six months of storing the used oil to sell to people since no more new oil would be, can be produced, didn't work. He found out that they were losing like $10,000 a month. So they had to get rid of all this oil. What were they going to do? They put it in the back of a truck and they drove it slowly around rural North Carolina, dumping it all around the um, on the roadsides. Um, the governor got involved. The state got involved. They went and removed um, uh, uh, tons and tons of soil from 13 um, from uh, I think it was 13 different. Um, no, it was um, uh, uh, a bunch of counties in Eastern North Carolina, it was 13 counties that were then thought of as places to put this stuff. Because once you've dug it up, they realized this is too dangerous to be on the side of the road. What are you gonna do with it? Um, they dug it up, but then they were like, well, where are you gonna put it? And they um, they narrowed it down to two sites, one in Chatham County and one in Warren County. Um, the federal government did prosecute um, the Burns and Ward. Um, they got um, uh, less than two years apiece. Uh, they started with 90 sites and they gave, ended up with one, um, but the one that they found was in Warren County, just so happened to be in a rural community, Shaco Township, um, that was um, about 85% um, African-American. So these are the descendants of the freed slaves who lived in Warren County prior to 1860. Dolly Burwell, who was a civil rights activist who had worked on the desegregation of schools in Warren County, stepped up to the plate and she began organizing. Um, the organizing started at the courthouse, which she said is the people's house. So we should be able to meet there. They got so many people in the courthouse, the courthouse can no longer hold them. So they went with the um, UCC. There was a um, uh, United Church of Christ um, congregation that was willing to host. And she working together with a couple of um, uh, residents of Massachusetts who had moved down to Warren County or environmentalists moved down to Warren County who were interested in a, a, a clean rural lifestyle, um, worked together with Dolly. About 300 residents at any given weekly meeting would show up at the UCC to hear what was going on, and they began to organize. Um, 
Then they mobilized. We see here a picture of the Reverend Dr. Ben Chavis. Um, here he is um, at the time. Here he is in Duke Chapel two years ago um, describing this. Reverend Dr. Ben Chavis was at UCC at the time. He'd been recently released from prison and was at Duke Divinity School. Um, and um, he um, uh, came down to Warren County and he was arrested for driving too slowly uh, at, because they knew that he was there to organize and help the mobilization effort. Um, he coined the term environmental racism. Um, uh, they did uh, uh, a mobilization effort. Um, Dolly Burwell herself and Reverend Dr. Ben Chavis have been celebrated nationally and other places. Now, they also did the kind of stuff that I do, which is to litigate on this and say, oh, this is a terrible place for a landfill. The, uh, you shouldn't put hazardous waste in this town, county because you can't dig a hole 10 feet deep that's not going to fill up with water almost immediately. It's very, what we call it, high water table, terrible place for a landfill. Uh, all those, all those um, arguments were factually true, but it didn't matter. In 1981, um, the EPA and the state of North Carolina won their, uh, the lawsuit that had been brought by the residents. So litigation failed. Nonviolent direct action continued. That put political pressure on the governor. The governor made a political promise, um, which the political promise actually did end up um, uh, resulting in the cleanup of the landfill because Governor Hunt made a promise after meeting as a result of the nonviolent direct action that was done, made a promise that he would correct the environmental injustice by seeking federal funds for uh, and state funds to clean the landfill after the technology had been developed. Um, he then uh, tried to run for Senate, didn't win, became governor again. And by the time he was governor again, the technology was available and he, and he kept his promise. And so the people did get the thing cleaned up eventually. And this is typically known as why North Carolina is one of um, the states that can claim being a birthplace of the environmental justice movement. I think of this a lot when I'm thinking about the law. Um, in environmental justice, it's a broader concept. I think environmental justice is very much directly related to both the social justice concepts of the Gospels and the environmental care concepts that I think come out of an idea of creation care as part of our stewardship role. Um, but the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which I've shown here, doesn't cover everything that we might think of right, as justice, because justice is much broader than just the justice system. Um, but the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is a potent legal tool, um, which I've been using for the last eight years to try and help communities that are facing some of these problems today um, fight with federal and state agencies to get justice. And now I'm done with this. I can stop the share and leave some time for some questions with you all. And Mike, I just... Um wanted to say very quickly, folks may have to drop off who are planning to go to church in person today. So I Understood. didn't want you to to feel bad if the if the list got smaller and smaller. But I won't. No, I perfectly understand that. I'm I'm I had not ever seen that bison map before. And I'm looking out in my backyard where we frequently have herds of deer moving through. And I'm just trying to wrap my brain around having bison here. It's, yeah. it's really, yeah. <laughs> um, more, um, they're not, they're not good written records um, from the, any of the indigenous cultures, you know, date predating colonization. Uh, so we don't know, as much about it as we'd like to. So most of those sightings are from colonists. So these are explorers, you know, your John Lawson's European colonists, but they clearly were here. And there is a lot of evidence that the um, burning that was going on. So there was um, prescribed burning that was one of the ways that uh, American Indians um, cultivated places for the buffalo. So they would, they would burn out um, copses of woodland in order to create pasture. And that essentially expanded the range of the buffalo in ways it wouldn't be if you didn't do this burning. Um, the Europeans looked at the burning and thought saw it was a waste. The American Indians did the burning because they knew it was a way to attract wildlife which on which they could live and subsist. And so it was a very it was a big cultural clash um, between those two. But yeah, they they think they came as as far um, east as the as the Catawba. So. 
Okay. Thanks, Anne, somebody are you tr muted. Anne, are you trying to ask a question? You're muted. Um, you, I guess you know that Norman Wurtz is responsible for our creation care. Uh, actually, he when he came and talked to us, he sort of made us feel guilty. So we that's how we started the creation care. No, Norman started. Uh, he was he's quite inspirational. But um, a question. Just I'm looking here over my porch and down in the the globe and thinking we're in the furniture business and. Uh, We've cut down a lot of trees around here, so I feel pretty guilty, but they've all grown back up, so maybe not so much, but, uh, uh, and then we started, we decided we didn't want to cut trees around here, so now we cut them down in Mississippi and some in Europe, so it's not quite as bad. <laughs> no, I agree, and, I, and when I said that about my ancestors, I just, I mean, I can't be, uh, guilt has a useful half-life of about 30 seconds. And beyond that, if it doesn't motivate you to action, I don't, especially if it's things your ancestors did, I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference. Um, yeah, because trees are things that we plant and things that we use. And the American Indians planted and used trees and occasionally cut them down too. Um, and I think, and they made furniture with them. They made, you know, they used them for all the kinds of things that we use them for. Maybe not all the kinds of things. They may not have decided to use them for, you know, some of the stuff that we might not necessarily always need, but I think that um, the idea that uh, furniture is one of those uses that can last for generations, especially when it's well-crafted and thoughtfully made. Um, is it better, for example, to cut down a tree that turns into a cabinet that you're going to have for a hundred years? Or is it better to have things that are chipped up and uh, burned um, or turned into like this Ikea furniture that I, I have some of this, my house has a combination of things that are hundreds of years old that were made lovingly with native trees and things that were made in some factory um out of press board um out of uh, uh with ikea and they won't last uh one move you know if you try and move an ikea bookcase um usually they usually don't survive the move so i do think that some of it has to be thoughtful when we think about our relationship especially to trees is is this something that we're making that has a life and, and certainly i'm sure much of the furniture that you're talking about is furniture that's still in people's homes and is still being enjoyed today and maybe for generations to come. That's a great sales pitch. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just had uh, some, I just used to left over milk, but yes, I would have some, but I'll need a new cup. Okay. When you make yours, so, if you'll make mine. Sarah, you're unmuted. I, I don't know if you realize oh. that. <laughs> Did, didn't know if you had a question for Reich or not. I have a question. Um, given the history of the things that happened with the Poverty Law Center at Chapel Hill, I hope that at Duke, being a private institution, that you're not under the types of pressure that um, is being exerted at many public universities through legislatures and our Board of Governors. Is that the case? It's been the case so far. Um, I've only fought Duke Energy twice. So if it were going to be, if there were going to be pressure, that would be problematic for my career, that would have been the time when I would have seen something. Um, we Early on, we did in my clinic, early on, we did sue the state of North Carolina over fishing practices that were um, harming and killing sea turtles. And the president pro tem of the Senate and um, the director of the Division of Marine Fisheries called the president of the university and the dean of the law school to complain about our meddling and um, both of them kind of went, meh. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a very different reaction. I mean, I'm a UNC law graduate, but I could not do what I do at UNC uh, or at any constituent institution of um, the University of North Carolina system because of the political pressure. So it's definitely been true and my experience that at Duke University, I'm free to do and work and say these things and not worry about it. Um, I think if I were at UNC Law School, I'd even be concerned about giving this talk. <laughs> so I, I think that I think that there are yes, you're you're exactly right, and you're hitting on something that does worry me a great be a great deal. Um, but it is one of the strengths I think of private institutions, and I can also say the same thing is true at Wake Forest School of Law. John Knox, who is on the faculty there in the environmental law field, has worked with the United Nations um, as a 
um, person who documents human rights violations as it relates to environmental justice. And John's at Wake Forest and he's had no problems. So, I mean, I think that in the private institutions, we don't see that kind of pressure being applied. That's very good to hear. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, Reich, before you leave us, I, I guess I would ask what, um, what would you say we as a fairly small congregation in Western North Carolina, what can we do to help support the work that you're doing? Well, I think certainly if you see you could reach out, I think, to other um, faculty and, and, and to talk about specific issues that are not necessarily through a political lens, but just through a, a pure science lens, because I definitely feel like um, and also I think maybe connecting up with other faith based organizations, because I do think that that's one of the issues that we are facing is it it's no matter the size of your congregation, it's always a small group within any Christian within any Christian church that's interested in issues related to creation. I've tried to have at Eden and Street, um, I tried one time to have a um, Earth Day event at Eden and Street, and I think 15 people showed up. And it's it, at that time, the church had 4,000 members. So it's never a large group at any church um, that are going to be interested in these things. So I think it's important to try and team up with others. So um, Interfaith Power and Light, which is a um, uh, a a subset of the of the um north carolina council of churches is i think a great resource um if you're thinking just about things related to energy and energy justice which is an important aspect of our environmental future um, they do great work and so i think probably working with interfaith organizations um in the presbyterian church one of the groups that has been founded is called the reimagining america project it's looking at social justice issues including environmental justice it's based out of charlotte so i know it's a ways away from you all but i do believe that it has pcusa and united church of christ members in that so that might be another thing you might look at the reimagining america project um i'll see if i can find a link to that um and and send it to you oh and chris so those are some thoughts and, and what I, I mean, you know, my clinic right now is in pretty good shape. Um, so if you see something, say something, you know, tell me about something that needs doing up there. I have worked from time to time with the Appalachian State University um, stream ecologist um, up there, um, Shay Tuberty, um, who's a, a field ecologist and does a lot of good work. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that, and, and, and many, in, it was many, many years ago, but I worked with um um, some um, local activists up there on solarized Boone initiatives um, mm -hmm. up in Boone. So I've worked up in that sort of area a little bit. So anyway. Well, great. Um, looks like we're just right, right at time. time. Yeah. Yeah, so. I know you got to get on to got to get on to service. So yeah, but uh, Reich, we really appreciate your time this morning and um, all the all the information and insights and we appreciate you for the work that you're doing in the fight uh, for environmental justice. 